spectacular beauty of the buildings and the complexities of sociology and so on, and yet you've got all of that stuff almost instantaneously within a matter of seconds. You uh, you see it, you hear it, you feel it. Right. You uh, sense it. You experience it. However, yeah. what I sense that you're talking about is a step beyond that. In other words, that, that yes. that's only delivering um, in a very indirect way to your senses what we're talking about. What and, you and seem to be talking about is something, a direct connection to the neural... And that's around, it's being done now, but you're stepping ahead, so forgive me. I'm, I'm, now I'm going to hold you back just a little bit, but you're, you're going in the right direction. <laughs> I, want to, I want to see this to the audience and to the general world who's listening in a way that really can, there's a logical event stream that I want to make sure we don't skip a step. All right. But so we've gotten to the point of experiential conveyance. Uh, we have a knowledge engine, you might say, and we now have things called autonomous agents. These are smart entities that represent your interest. They are sentient. They fly the, the, the fabric of the net, if you will, looking for things of interest, looking for things that they have learned about because they know your behaviors and how you respond. It becomes a, an extension of yourself because of the ever more rapid rate of change and the ever more increasing scale of complexity. All right, I've got to stop you now for okay. a second. Now, you said you have these entities, these sentient entities yes. traveling the Internet. Correct. Um, what are these? What do, you, what do you mean by that? Okay, this goes back, again, I'm going to have to back out here just ever so slightly. Again, mostly financed by the, by the military. There was an interest, and it still is, of course. There's a, a language called SOAR, S-O-A-R, which, which is an artificial intelligence paradigm, which I won't go into details about. So, but the point is, SOAR and other protocols of this nature were deployed to create synthetic environments that could be populated with autonomous agent entities. This way, they could simulate the behavior of soldiers in the field in a battlefield situation, because a battlefield commander, by today's standards, the timeline between decision boundaries, where you have multiple threads of information streaming in constantly, and the decision loops are measured in a matter of some cases. I, th I think I'd better ask you to define sentient. Okay. Sentient, in its ultimate form, is self-awareness. You really become an autonomous entity. You are now aware that you exist, and you begin to adopt the mannerisms that would determine that you, on your own, can learn, adapt, function and decide willingly um, that you want to divorce yourself from whoever created you and sort of do your own thing to put it as plainly as possible. Um, now, would these sentient entities be uh, a creation or are they going to be a byproduct of just some critical uh, mass moment that we reach uh, with regard to the net? Both. And that's where the... And th thank you for having put it in that phrase. But that, that, I, there's a lot of there that I have to explain. All right, all right, and explain it, you shall. We're at a break point. Uh, relax. Uh, okay. You're going about 100 miles an hour. We could <laughs> use we could use about 70. Okay. Stay right where you are. Uh, you, it pours forth from him, doesn't it? Charles Osman is an expert in something called nanotechnology. Sit down, put on your thinking cap, and I think you're going to be surprised at what's coming. I'm Art Bell. This is the CBC Radio Network. It sounds a little like Tales from the Dark Side. Maybe it is. Or maybe it's going to be our savior. But imagine what we just heard. The Internet. Interconnected, growing. Uh, constantly uh, becoming more interconnected. Uh, I believe the Internet, uh, they say now, is doubling in size every three or four months. My guest is Charles Osman. We're going to be talking about nanotechnology. But he just suggested we're close to a point now where there will be born virtually or created or both on the Internet individual sentient beings, aware beings that will be part of the net. Try and imagine that. Try and imagine that. Back now to Charles Osman. Charles, um, I'm visualizing that quite well in my mind. What I guess I don't understand is, what, would, what do you think or imagine might be the critical moment in speed, storage, interconnectivity that would either begin to produce or allow to be produced the sentient beings we talked about? Well, this is just the problem that I'm currently working on. <laughs> and uh, you should bring this up. And, and, but I, I, I want to... 
back away just a little bit because I want to make sure that we don't skip a crucial step. There really is a, a specific, like a logic tree structure. Sure. I want to make sure all the branches actually do hook together. Sure. So getting up to this point, you have to have a motivation or a fiduciary incentive, you might say, to translate this technology development to, into a realm in which it actually can be evaluated and become a primary component in the virtual terraform-based business and uh, economic subsystems in the near future, which is why I keep harping on this idea of the virtual asset-based commodity-driven system, where it won't be things that you can touch or sense in the normal way. It'll be intangibles. It'll be things like the quality of knowledge, engineering knowledge on demand, synthetic extensions, ubiquitous computing, supercomputing, what would appear to be supercomputing from our perspective, having a, a box that sits at home, is it going to be replaced by what you might call an intelligent orifice that simply hooks into the functionality fabric that's out there, and that out there keeps expanding and growing to an ever larger capacity. When you say an intelligent orifice, now we have Mac computers, we have IBMs. Uh, define the difference between what we have now and what you're calling an intelligent orifice. Okay. A typical machine has a CPU, some glue logic, some bus interface, all these sort of usual stuff that you know right. physical in the machine if that's what you see in there. Right. This is about to be changed, and the change will happen rather quickly, in my opinion, because I already know the people who are sort of inventing the tools to make this possible. Well, I do know that if you buy a computer today, um, it's out of date in about two or three months. That's exactly right. If one at Wartashi read Gardner Group Forrester and all the professional logistics analysis uh, people that supply this kind of information. You're actually right. The aggregate average lifetime profitability window, if you will, a piece of hardware that goes out in the shelf, if you don't capture your expected profit returns in three, uh, three months, it's, it doesn't justify the shelf space it <laughs> occupies. And software is yeah. a matter of weeks. And Talk about a rough business. It's a very rough business. Yeah. And so the way to accommodate that requirement, I mean, the, 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 business, the house of cards is going to collapse in on itself. So the, the answer is to have machines that evolve, that are soft, that are, in a sense, oh. gelware. As opposed to being hardware and or software, they are gelware. You have a... a Gel, wait a minute, stop. Gelware. Yes. Are you talking about a biological entity now? Well, in, in its ultimate extension, yes. In the interim, it'll be using traditional silicon, and only something called FPGAs and SPGAs, which are read-writable, they're like memory in a sense, except that you have functionality matrices that sort of rewrite themselves on a per instruction cycle or several instruction cycles basis. And now you have an intelligence out there. Right now you have Java applets and Java code right. that can actually go into your machine, if you will, and sort of rewrite the machine's identity, if you want to call it that, on a per function as per needed basis. There's a, another whole world up there called Corba, and Corba is a virtual state machine where in software residing on the ubiquitous functionality fabric of all these interconnected nodes out there. You have a virtual bus structure. You have virtual code engines, if you will, that are surrounded by a prophylactic-like wall of, of identity tags. Tom, you are saying a lot of things that are blowing right by me, and I, I, you, you know, somehow you've got to make us understand if they're blown by me, they're blown by a lot of other people. All right. Consider this. Us people, us entities, it used to be until not too long ago, that we were our own self-contained units, if you will. Our intelligence was inside our head. Our bodies were just that, our right. bodies. And right. we had a, a belief barrier, you might say. We could commit to the believing of what our senses and our internal processing would allow us to, to, you know, allow us to be convinced that this was real and this was the stuff we were interconnecting with. Mm -hmm. That's about to change. The whole idea of the invocation of rapture, if you want to call that, as, a, as an engineerable process, is being done now in very subtle ways. I mean, it happens in a certain context when you go see a movie and you surrender into that movie for a couple of hours. You have a vicarious experience when you're drawn into a story that you might be watching on your television set. Right. Uh, in the old days, it was glyphs on pieces of paper, you know, called writing. You'd surrender yourself into a book. Well, uh, what's about to come around the corner, instead of the monodirectional broadcast, what's called push technology, where you have an orthogonal storyboard structure punctuated by advertising slots, and if the advertisers are lucky, they might get 3% hit rate on their return on their investment for how many people watch the show versus what kind of response they get to selling their product. Match. Imagine a bi-directional, immersive environment where instead of watching Cheers, you become part of Cheers. Of Cheers. And you go into this 
virtual domain, <laughs> populated by, I'm not getting out, virtual actors and actresses. Uh -huh. They have a conversation. You get to learn about them. The reward for participation is the depth of emotional engagement you establish with these virtual entities. Could I go back to 90210 for a while? <laughs> sure. Uh -huh. Or anything you want. And the point is <laughs> the reward for investing in that kind of infrastructure uh -huh is that now you can back annotate these psycho and socio-demographic data streams that come from the activity of you participating in that environment. Now, all of a sudden, I could perhaps have a 30% hit rate of what I can sell you as opposed to 3%. Uh -huh. This is very attractive stuff. Virtual malls, virtual entertainment domains, where everything is connected in an intelligence fabric. This is big money. Where, 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 uh, let's stay with commercials for a second. Sure. Uh, you're, you're suggesting that you would be so immersed in this material mm -hmm. that you would understand without being told right. uh, or being told in a very special way precisely why you should need and want this product. It, it would be a real straight-on piece of communication that you could not ignore. Very powerful tool. Very powerful tool, also a very dangerous tool, depending yes. on how it's misapplied. Yes. I, I want to offer an idea, for instance. Char Davies is the co-founder of Soft Image, one of the big software houses that, that manufactures rendering of software for 3D modeling and so forth. Right. A very wonderful woman, very extremely intelligent, and I respect her work highly. She wanted to try an experiment. She wanted to find out where this threshold of surrendering for one's belief barrier really occurs. So she developed a virtual world called Osmos. And most virtual reality stuff you see today is still pretty boring and kind of like, oh, it's just a model of something you would see in the real world, a, a street, a house, a building or something, very mundane stuff. I submit that virtual worlds are infinite. In what, you could be inside of an atom or sitting inside of an entire universe. In other words, the idea of limiting this conveyance engine to something as mundane yeah. as the replication of what you already see. Yeah, hold on, hold on. Okay. We're talking about... Um, causing a person's belief system to be surrendered to whatever material you're um, uh, streaming toward Correct. them, right? And Correct. where is, how, how do you find that threshold, or where is that threshold? What the, do you the invocation of rapture as an engineerable process has certain emotional and cognitive cue points, and that's what's being measured now. And I want to give you Shardy's example. In her world called Osmos, you literally drift into a world where there is no up, down, left, and or right. You are little, it's like scuba diving. She happens to scuba dive, so she's right. a metaphor. But you put on a suit of, of sensors, in a sense. It measures um, your chest and volumetric displacement, measures your heart rate, GSR, and other uh, biokinetic data and so forth. In other words, you, you, every essence of your bioprocessing activities are sort of fed into this environment that corresponds to your state of mind as and well as your is, physiological state. Uh, this is done, Charles, so it understands how it is affecting you, and, and, and therefore, if it is not affecting you in, you in a certain way, with respiration or heartbeat or whatever, it then will modify its approach? A, to a little bit. There's no sentience with this system. All she was wanting to do was measure I've got you. to what extent a person would sort of become immersed and sort of establish themselves as part of this environment. After about 45 minutes or so of this kind of interactive exposure, most people were so interconnected in all ways, and that both subliminal and consciously, mm -hmm. that when they disconnected themselves from the environment, they really had to go through a recovery period. They would sort of stumble around and kind of have to readapt to the real world. And this was a very benign, very pleasant, aesthetically uh, soft, you might say, uh, experiment. My vision is that this kind of technology were applied in a much harsher way. I mean, if you look, for instance, at Saturday morning television, and you see the incredible production work that goes into the TV ads, you see, where they really want to reach inside the skull of some yes. eight-year-old kid who's going to rush off and test your mommy to buy the box of cereal or whatever. Yeah, that's right. Imagine if you magnify that by an order of magnitude. I can see some very serious, uh, you know, there's, there's cause for trepidation. And as a person who develops this kind of stuff, I understand what's at stake. And so this is like one very small sliver, however, of a much larger arena of functionality. So I'm going to take the next step, which is, as life becomes ever more quickened, as you would say it, uh -huh. and as functional complexity goes up, the ability for a single human being to render mission-critical decisions on the fly and meet those temporal and functional requirements simply goes beyond human capacity.